and stand and face the cross and begin to our I promise you guys I thought this first thing I ever did. So I'm sorry. You know, when I thought this, it feels like it's just something. Uh, yeah. O Master who loves mankind, illuminate our hearts with the pure light of your divine knowledge and open the eyes of our mind to understand the teachings of your holy scriptures. Instill in us also the fear of your blessed commandments that we may overcome all carnal desires and train us upon a spiritual life and understanding and acting in all things according to your holy will. For you are the enlightenment of our souls and bodies, O Christ God, and to you we give glory together with your Father and your all holy, gracious, and life-giving Spirit, both now and ever and in the ages of ages. All right, we took it kind of easy last time, so we've got to go a little faster this time. Yeah. I'm joking, but we do have to go fast. Uh, it's at the, um, yes. Is there a WWW in there? Yes. Uh, I don't, look, I am totally confident when it comes to um, computers, but for some reason, I think when you type this in, it's supposed to come up. Is there supposed to be a WWW in there? I don't think so. Not necessary. I had a hard time getting it to come up, but I'm pretty sure that's the exact thing. If you type this in, you can download our seminars now, which means you're being recorded. And, uh, Yes. Well, the first two are up. The third one last week will be up hopefully tonight or tomorrow. And the ones that we had on Pope Benedict the 16th and the Holy Mass, they're all there. Dr. Cutterbacks is being recorded. So they'll probably show up, you know, meet afterwards or whatever. The gentleman doing this is donating, donated the sits, he's donated his time. It's fantastic. And uh, so we're very thankful to him for that. So if you want to write that, that down, feel free. Uh, a few announcements. Lent is coming. Lent is coming. Prepare now. Um, Lent practicum for the office, for the divine office. Father grips over, right? He does his thing at the beginning of every liturgical season for us. It's there. The flyer's back there. Uh, if you want a reminder for yourself, you can stick our flyer up on your, uh, you know, refrigerator, um, in your office, on your front door. Give it out to your neighbors. Um, Dr. Cutterback was here on Wednesday, last Wednesday. He'll be here for two more Wednesdays. Excellent. I highly recommend it. Uh, I probably over recommend, but it's whatever. Anyways, he's excellent. And who was here? Was he good? Excellent. Yeah, he's excellent. I'm not going to bring garbage speakers here. Okay, so there you go. Really great speaker. I took uh, many, many classes from him. Uh, also, Islam. Islam's a tough topic, so I brought in the man, Dr. William Marshner. Again, he is the man. Uh, yeah, he's, uh, he's like triple doctorate, and he's the smartest man in the world. <laughs> um, how's that? He's a professor, professor of theology at Christendom. He was founding faculty, and uh, he's just... He's unbelievable in his knowledge, and he's a convert, convert from Protestantism, and uh, as you can see, he smokes a pipe, if you have this little picture there. He's quite a character. You know, these guys are just too smart for their own good, and they're, that's him. So, he's a little bit strange, but in a good way. And then, of course, your uh, trusty little flyer to hand out to, uh, you know, all your friends and all that good stuff. Okay. Any questions? Will this talk be recorded? Dr. Marshner? I don't know yet. Talks in here record, I know that one will be. Uh, you'll notice on there it's two talks in a row, a little break in between, and then a little question and answer period. So it's the morning of, up until like 11.45 or whatever it is. Why is it not be uh, recorded? Because it's down there. I don't know. It might be recorded, but don't plan on it. Make sure you're there. Bring your friends. Um, and uh, it's be here. It'll be over there because we're probably gonna get a lot of people. 
okay? And you guys got to start bringing your friends to this. We don't have enough people at these things. Okay, it's a joke. But really, I'm, you know how big this parish is? And, we, and uh, we really, in all reality, should have hundreds of people coming to a Bible study. Not because of me, but because of a Bible study. So bring your friends and uh, let's make it a movement and save the world for Jesus. <laughs> we finished last time with uh, the great story of Sisera and Jael and the spike through his temple into the ground and all those good things. How many of you are here for the first time? Oh, okay, not too many. I'm sorry you're here for the first time. We're going to go really fast, so try to catch up. Um, we also finished with the book of Ruth. We had kind of a double ending, my sister ending, which was fun, and a Ruth ending, which ended in a genealogy. And at the end of the book of Ruth, we got that great genealogy about the man Perez. And uh, we got the story of Ruth and Boaz. Do you remember the, the story of Ruth and Boaz? Do you go back and read it? I hope. Okay, good. Good story. And um, who is Boaz's father? Go back there. Go to the book of Ruth real quick. Chapter 4. Ruth comes right after Judges. So that's Salmon. Solomon. 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 Solomon ends up marrying who? <laughs> who does Solomon marry? This is, it's not a bad thing. What's that? No. No. Which chapter? Chapter 4. It doesn't say it there. I'm just wondering if anybody knows. <laughs> Yeah, so Solomon marries Rahab. I got Solomon there. All right, remember Rahab was the harlot, prostitute, whatever, right, that converted when Israel came into the Holy Land. And she ends up becoming an ancestor of Christ. And so Solomon ends up marrying her. We don't know about that marriage all the way until the book of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, but we'll get there. So she's important. Um, about Ruth, do you remember where where was Ruth from? Plains of Moab. Moab. She was a Moabite woman. You remember the problem with the Moabites when Israel was encamped out there, right? They got involved in all the uh, worship of the gods and the fun that went along with it for the firstborn. Okay, so they they were a, a pagan society and they worshipped many gods. Jeff Cavins had a great quote. I thought I'd read it to you because it was. It was nicely put. At a time when Israel was turning away from the one God to follow many gods, Ruth, a Moabite, turned from the worship of many to follow the one. Okay, so we get all these great stories in salvation history about uh, Israel, um, in a sense, becoming a harlot, turning away from her husband, her God, her Lord, and going after other husbands or other gods or other lords. Okay, and then through that story, we get a, a number of people that do the opposite. Okay, and they end up on the side of salvation. Uh, Boaz marries Ruth. Solomon marries Rahab. Boaz marries Ruth, right? And Boaz's son is? Obed. And Obed's son is? Jesse. Jesse. And Jesse's son is? David. David. Okay, great. So we followed this line all the way from Adam all the way to David now. The covenant storyline. Okay, the family of God. Turn to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 1. Chapter 1. Verse 1. Remember I told you, never stop in between the books. Never stop in between the chapters, of course. The chapters are put in there later on. So if you stop at the end of a chapter, you end up losing most of the story. But also between the books, we have to keep reading. So, uh, Sheila, why don't you go ahead and read that? You can just kind of scan those names for us. Don't worry about pronouncing this right. There was a certain man of Ramathayim Zophim of the hill country of Ephraim whose name was Elkanah, the son of, son of Jeroham, son of Elihu, son of Tohu, son of Zoph, and Ephraimite. Right. He had two wives, the name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. 
Now this man used to go up year by year from his city to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh, where the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests of the Lord. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Penina, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. And although he loved Hannah, he would give Hannah only one portion, because the Lord had closed her womb. Okay, stop for a second, because we shouldn't have started. We should start a little bit earlier. But remember that story, okay? This man goes up to sacrifice. He has two wives, and Hannah's womb is closed. She's barren, okay? And usually barren women in the Old Testament at some point become fertile and have important babies. So always pay attention to the barren women, okay? Uh, turn back with me past Ruth to Judges again. I should have started just a little earlier. To chapter uh, 16. Do you remember the book of Judges is a story of a number of judges, 12 or 13, depending on how you count them, of men that came along to save Israel from its uh, wayward acts. Okay, you remember, they, there was a generation that grew up after Joshua who did not know the Lord. You remember that? Who did not know the Lord. And so God sends them judges to lead them. And what happens? The judge comes, the people repent, they follow the Lord, everything's okay, the judge dies, and then what happens? People fall away. Yeah, the people fall away. So the book of Judges, just that story, back and forth like that. And the last judge is who? Devil. No. Samson. Samson, right? And in chapter 16, verse... Um, uh, verse 30... And Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. The Philistines had captured him and they roped him to this pillar underneath this room and they were having a big old party and he's under there and he ends up, he rides a big old strong guy, rips the post down and kills everyone, including himself. Then he bowed with all his might and the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people that were in it. So the dead whom he slew at his death were more than those whom he had slain during his life. And, and so on. Okay, and he dies. So Samson dies. Chapter 17, verse 1. Okay, Sheila, go ahead. There was a man of the hill country of Ephraim. Okay, just real quick before you start, what's going to happen? The judge dies. All right, all right, go ahead. What? His name was Micah, and he said to his mother, The eleven hundred pieces of silver which were taken from you, about which you uttered a curse, and also spoke it in my ears, behold, the silver is with me. I took it. And his mother said, Blessed be my son by the Lord. And he restored the eleven hundred pieces of silver to his mother, and his mother said, I consecrate the silver to the Lord from my hand for my son, to make a graven image and a molten image. Now therefore I will restore it to you. So when he restored the money to his mother, his mother took 200 pieces of silver and gave it to the silversmith, who made it into a graven image and a molten image. And it was in the house of Micah. And the man Micah had a shrine, and he made an ephod and teraphim, and installed one of his sons, who became his priest. Ooh, bad idea. Keep going. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. Okay, so every man did what is right in his own eyes. We get a certain repetition that happens here in the next few chapters. Look at chapter 18, verse 1. Go ahead, Sheila. In those days, there was no king in Israel. And in those days, the tribe of the Danites was seeking for itself an inheritance to dwell in. Okay, so you can imagine, again, this repetition, there's no king in Israel, every man's doing what he thinks is right, and what are they doing? Well, they're building idols and whatnot. Look at chapter 19, verse 1. Go ahead, Sheila. In those days, when there was no king in Israel, a certain Levite was sojourning in the remote parts of the hill country of Ephraim, who took to himself a concubine from Bethlehem in Judah. Okay, bad idea. Take your concubine. Take go. And his concubine became angry with him, and she went away from him to her father's house at Bethlehem in Judah. Okay, you guys can read that story. It's kind of a, that's a pretty wild story. We don't have time to get into it. Um, <laughs> chapter 21, verse 25. Chapter 21, verse 25. 
In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. Okay. So you have this, again, this repetition that the last judge dies and kind of things just go crazy, fall apart. Nobody's following the Lord. And we get the story of Ruth, which fits in there. Okay? And then you're right there to 1 Samuel. Okay, we got the, the, uh, the story of Hannah, who's barren. And what does Hannah do? She goes, she prays, she weeps in the temple, she prays before the Lord. And in chapter 1, verse 19 of 1 Samuel. They rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord. Then they went back to their house at Ramah, and Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. And in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Samuel. For she said, I have asked him of the Lord. Okay, when she was in the temple praying, I'm going to take off my time, because I don't mind really hot up here. Um, <laughs> Uh, when she's in the temple praying, she says, Lord, if you will give me a son, I will dedicate him to the temple. Okay, and so she has a son, and sure enough, she brings him back and dedicates him to the house of God. Okay, the, the temple hadn't been built yet, but to the house of God where the Ark of the Covenant was dwelling. And you can read that story of Samuel growing up there in the house and receiving the revelations of God. Um, so Samuel grows up, he judges Israel, he, lead, he leads Israel, and turn to 1 Samuel chapter 8. The in-between time is his story of him growing up and um, coming into his own as a judge of Israel. Chapter 8, verse 1. You guys have heard the name Samuel before, right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> when Samuel became old, he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn son was Joel, and the name of his second, Abijah. There were judges in Be'er Sheba, yet his sons did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after Cain. They took bribes and perverted justice. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah, and said to him, Behold, you are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to govern us, like all the nations. Okay, stop. What do you guys think of that? Good idea? Why not? Because God is the king. Ah, God is, you're right, God is their king. We're not quite there yet, but God is their king. Okay, not only that, what's wrong with their request? What do they ask for? Money. God, give us a holy king. No, what do they say? Like the other nations. Yeah, give us, give us a king like all the other nations. Bad idea. Okay, keep going, Sheila. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to govern us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Hearken to the voice of the people in all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. According to all the deeds which they have done to me, from the day I brought them up out of Egypt even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are also doing to you. Now then, hearken to their voice only. We shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. Okay. Verse 19. Chapter 8, verse 19. But the people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel, and they said, No, but we will have a king over us that we also may be like all the nations, and that our king may govern us and go out before us and fight our battles. And when Samuel had heard all the words of the people, he repeated them in the ears of the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Hearken to their voice and make them a king. Samuel then said to the men of Israel, Go every man to his city. Okay. Just by, I should have mentioned this a long time ago, but um, as far as just studying your guys' Bible, and we're going to a lot of material, it's really hard. It might be easy if you have highlighters that are color-coded. And if you look at my Bible, it looks like a rainbow because I go through and I color-code it. So anytime there's something that's sinful, it gets a certain color, and it makes it very easy to read the text. Okay, so when I'm scanning, I can scan a book really fast and pick up all the storyline because it's all highlighted, and in my mind, I understand the way it works. Okay, so I just put that out there as a recommendation for you guys. Um, they make like eight different colors of highlighters and you can go crazy with it. Okay, so like all the other nations, chapter 9, verse 1. 
There was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, and the son of Abiel, son of Zeror, son of Bekorath, son of Aphia, a Benjamite, a man of wealth. And he had a son whose name was Saul. Ah, Saul becomes the first king of Israel, right? No. Who's the first king of Israel? David. David. No. We haven't gotten to David yet. Who? God? Yeah, God's the first king of Israel. Oh, transform. And he had a son whose name was Saul. Now notice how they describe Saul. Remember they're looking for a king like all the other nations. A handsome young man. There was not a man among the people of Israel more handsome than he. From his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. Okay? Not what you want to look for in a king. Okay? Doesn't say he's a great leader. In fact, when they go to anoint him, guess what he does? He goes and hides among the baggage. All the people that journeyed to go anoint the king, and they have all their baggage probably piled up, you know? And he goes and hides himself in the baggage. He said, where is he at, the man that you brought for us, Samuel? He says, I don't know. And somebody found him in the baggage. Not a good idea. So you can imagine what the story of Saul is going to be all about. Chapter 10, verse 1. Andrew, you want to give that to us? Chapter 10, verse 1. Then Samuel took a vial of oil and poured it on his head and kissed him and said, Has not the Lord anointed you to be prince over his people Israel? And you shall reign over the people of the Lord, and you will save them from the hand of their enemies round about. Okay, verse 17. Now Samuel called the people together to the Lord at Mizpah, and he said to the people of Israel, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I brought up Israel out of Egypt, and I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians, and from the hand of all the kingdoms that were oppressing you. But you have this day rejected your God, who saves you from all your calamities and your distresses, and you have said, No, but set a king over us. Now therefore, present yourselves before the Lord by your tribe and by your thousands. Okay, so again, you can imagine what kind of king Saul is going to be. He ends up committing two major sins that you got to know because he ends up being rejected because of what he does. Do you guys know what that is? Anybody? What's that? He goes to uh, somebody who reads a picture. He goes to this woman who reads his future. So. Yeah, he, he does do that. Okay, but even before he does that, that's kind of later on when he's like on his last legs and he goes and does the whole divinization thing and tries to find out his future, which is doubly bad idea. Okay. Even before that, chapter 13, verse 8. 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 8. Chapter 13, verse 8. Now, what had happened was Samuel, as he anoints David, says, or anoints Saul, he says, Go and wait for me seven days, and I will come to you. Okay? And I'll come to you. And what happens? All of a sudden, Samuel or Saul's got a, a battle on his hands. Okay? Uh, chapter 13, verse 5. And the Philistines mustered to fight with Israel, okay? So the Philistines gather against Israel, and, and Saul's waiting around going, when's, when's Samuel, when's Samuel going to show up? When's he going to show up? And so what does he do? Does he wait? Does he wait for the priest of God to come and sacrifice so that they have a successful battle? Nah. Verse, verse 8, he waited seven days, the time appointed by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattering from him. So he's, this whole, this whole uh, uh, group of Philistines has come up against him for battle, and now everybody's leaving him because he's not going to war. And so what does he do? But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattering from him. So Saul said, bring the burnt offerings here to me, and the peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offerings. Bad idea. He's not a Levite. He's not a priest of God. He's, do, he's doing things he should not be doing. And so Samuel finally shows up and says, what have you done? Okay? And he ends up... Um, let's see if it's right there in front of me. Yeah, he shows up. Verse 10. As soon as he had finished offering the burnt offerings, behold, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him and salute him. And Samuel said, What have you done? And Saul said, When I saw that the people were scattering from me and that you did not come within the days appointed, the Philistines had mustered uh, at Michmash. I said, Now the Philistines will come down upon me at Gilgal, and I have not entreated the favor of the Lord. So I forced myself and offered the burnt offerings. And he forced himself to, to commit the sin. 
To, to wait for the priest to come. Cold down and die, yeah, the on Sunday when you're in the church and the priest doesn't show up, <laughs> don't go stand up there and vest. Okay? <laughs> it happens. Sure. I've seen it. Well, <laughs> he couldn't have gone to war either, right? That would have been a sin also. Yeah, probably the best thing is to trust the Lord and say when it is the time, Lord's time, then he will, he will give me his blessing and I will go out to battle. Okay? And chapter 15. Saul does a couple things in the intervening chapters. He ends up going to battle again, again and, and he's instructed by Samuel to go and to kill all of the men, okay, and don't keep any of the things they found, okay? You burn everything, whatever, because why? The people he's fighting against, again, were idolaters. And again and again, they end up keeping things that they shouldn't keep. You remember, this whole story of salvation history is a bloody story. Okay? And it's bloody because it's a battle for the life of man. And what is God going to do when he sees his very children going astray and risking the detriment of their souls? Okay? It's better that our body is sacrificed than our soul. And so... Time and time and time again, we get a, we get these battles where ma- men are killed. Okay, in order that God can bring salvation to man, because at the stage they're at in history, their souls are dead and they need the sanctifying grace of God. Okay, so what does He do? Chapter fifteen, verse seven, Andrew. And Saul defeated the Malachites from Hiblah as far as Shur, which is east of Egypt. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag, and the best of the sheep and of the oxen of the fatling and of the lambs, and all that was good, and would not utterly destroy them. All that was despised and worthless, they utterly destroyed. Okay, so why do you think they saved well they saved the best of the of the sheep and things like that? Okay, for obvious reasons. Why would they save the king? Why wouldn't they kill the king? The evil king that was battling against him. What do you think? Humiliated. Yeah, exactly. As a trophy in a sense, right? Turn back with me. You keep your hand there. Turn back with me to Judges chapter 1 verse 6 real quick. Judges 1 6. It's just back one, uh, well, about 50 pages there, not too far. (laughs) Judges chapter 1 verse 6. A similar story, except we get a little more details. Judges chapter 1, verse 6. Okay, Andrew, go ahead. Don't read ahead. <laughs> and then as Bezek fled, so they pursued him and caught him, and cut off his thumbs and his great toes. And John of Bezek said, Seventy kings with their thumbs and their great toes cut off, used to pick up scraps under my table. As I have done, so God has requited me. And they brought him to Jerusalem, and he died there. Okay, so to humiliate him, okay, and as a trophy for the other king to say, look, you know, it's kind of like the uh, scalping, the Indian scalping, right? Something like that. Except this is even worse, cutting off the fingers and toes. Mm. Ah. All right. Turn back to 1 Samuel, in chapter 16, verse 1. Which one are you 1 Samuel. 1 oh. Samuel, chapter 16, verse 1. Okay, so through these two sins, these two major offenses against God, Saul ends up getting rejected as king, and who's the next one to come? David. David. Okay, Sheila, go ahead and read that for us. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul, seeing I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehem Mike. For I have provided for myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. And invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. Okay, verse 13. Actually, let's go back a little bit from verse 13 to... um, Verse 10. What happens? He goes to Jesse's house and he goes through all of Jesse's sons. Saying, and Samuel says, no, that's not the right one. That's not the right one. That's not it. All the way from the oldest, all the way down the line. Okay, to verse 10. 
And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. And Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but behold, he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, oh, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. Okay, so you get David. What kind of man is David? Boy. He's a what? Somebody said shepherd, right? He's a shepherd. Okay, he's a young man, he's a boy, okay, and he's a shepherd. The rest of the book of 1 Samuel is the story of Saul and David battling it out in some sense, okay? The story of their, um, their relationship, okay? Saul does not give up being king that easy. And so the rest of the story is a story of David growing up, okay? Sometimes a friend of the king, sometimes an enemy of the king. All the way until Saul dies. Okay, so turn, just go ahead and turn past the rest of 1 Samuel, because that's the story of it. Back and forth, this whole story. It's a very fascinating story. You guys can read that on your own. Okay, to 2 Samuel chapter 2. Do we know any Do we have rings people in here? What? Are you following along okay? Yeah, okay. Your books are all different anyway. Yeah, they're all different. Um, what did I say? 2 Samuel chapter 2, verse 1. 2 Samuel chapter 2, verse 1. Go ahead, Sheila. After this, David inquired of the Lord, Shall I go up into any of the cities of Judah? And the Lord said to him, Go up. David said, To which shall I go up? And he said, To Hebron. So David went up there and his two wives also, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail, the, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. And David brought up his men who were with him, everyone with him. And they dwelt in the towns of Hebron. And the men of Judah came, and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. Okay. So he anointed king. Turn to chapter 5 with me. Sorry, I'm going to go so fast here. So, you know, yes. it says that David is anointed the king of the house of Judah. Yes. That's not all the tribes. Right. Okay, so where are we at, if you don't mind, tribes-wise now? Okay. Yeah. When they speak of he's anointed the house of Judah, first of all, what tribe is he from? Judah. Judah. So for, probably there was multiple anointings. In fact, it really does take place. There's a number of times, we've read it before, he's anointed, right? And he's anointed again, and he's anointed again. I'd like to write a paper on this, how there's multiple anointings in Israel, and so when Christ comes, he actually receives this kind of triple anointing through his life. But that's a whole other story. But he's anointed for the house of Judah, so he's king of the house of Judah, and the house of Judah, the tribe of Judah, is the tribe which rules over all of Israel. So it's another way of saying king of Israel, okay, but it's also maybe a way of speaking back or forward about a time when the kingdom's going to split. We're going to talk about that later, and the kingdom that stays in the south. Not split yet. Not yet, no. Okay. Is that what you're going with? Yeah, that's what I'm doing. I think it's just another way of saying he's ruler of Israel. House of Judah rules Israel. So, thank you. Okay. Um, Chapter 5, verse 1. Then all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, Behold, we are your bone and flesh. See, it's probably what happens. I didn't read close enough, but back there he probably was anointed king of the house of Judah. Okay? And later on he's acclaimed by all of Israel. Okay, in chapter 5. We are bone and we are we are your bone and flesh. In times past, when Saul was king over us, it was you that led out and, and brought in Israel. And the Lord said to you, You shall be shepherd of my people Israel, and you shall be prince over, over Israel. So all the elders of Israel came to the king at, at Hebron, and King David made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord. And they anointed David king of Israel. There you go. Okay, there's a third anointing that we've got from him. Okay? So now he becomes king of Israel. That's a good point to point out. All right. I asked who David is. He's a shepherd. Okay, he grows up as a shepherd. When we're reading the scriptures, I've said this before to you guys, you've got to try to get into the mind of the author. 
okay, who's writing, and you get a better sense of what's going on. For the next oh, two sessions together, we're going to be talking a lot about that because most of the time in the rest of the scriptures, most of the time people haven't gotten to this point, but if they do get to this point, and we start to get into the prophets, we get lost. And most people read the prophets completely out of context, and that's a problem. Okay, And it's the same here with King David. What did King David traditionally write? Psalms. The Psalms. How many people read the Psalms on a fairly regular basis? Okay, uh, alright, maybe we wish there was more, but uh, anyways, there's a decent number. How many of you that do, re do read the Psalms have studied the life of David intimately? Like, read every detail you find about him? None. One. Alright, good. Good Protestant convert. <laughs> Don't you dare say it. <laughs> That's true. Well, I was at Edmund's baptism, so. Um, all right, so when we're reading the book of Psalms, again, we have to place it within the life of King David. I want to read you a great quote I found from um, Raul Knox. This is what he says. The Psalms of David are, as it were, the church's nursery rhymes. It is on that music that she falls back for consolations. The Psalms of David, we call them. Learned people would have us believe that this is a false title. The collection is only an anthology by various authors. It certainly does seem reasonable, saving the better judgment of the church, to suppose that a psalm written about the Babylonian captivity, which we haven't gotten to yet, was written by somebody who had experience of it. But even if you allow for that here and there, common sense tells you that the bulk of the Psalter is King David's work. In the first place, because a great literary tradition does not grow around a man's name unless he really has some literary work to his credit. Imitators do not arise until there is something to imitate. Typo. Uh, yeah, you can trace David's. You can trace David all through the Psalms, as Gerda's work is full of Gerda. David's work is full of David. You are haunted everywhere by the echoes of his breathless career, by his, by sorry, by association. The Psalter has become a great organ of human sentiment, upon whose steps the Holy Spirit varies the moods of divine melody. Imagine for a moment a devout Jew reading the Psalter reading the same phrases that you read. Think what those phrases mean to him and what they mean to you. Thus each of us, as he goes through the Psalter, can trace in it a kind of secret code, a cipher by which God and the soul speak to one another. That's beautiful, huh? All right. Turn to Psalm 23. The Psalms, now hold on, actually we're going to do a little, little practice here, it's really basic. Keep your hand where you're at in 2 Samuel, and then turn to Psalm. keep it there, okay? Turn to the Psalms. 23. Psalm 23, which is going to be 24, right? Or 22, I'm sorry. It's Psalm 23, but in the, in the uh, Dewey Rings it's 22. So 22 or 23? Psalm 23. Okay. Okay. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. In burden pastures he gives me repose. Beside restful waters he leads me. He refreshes my soul. He guides me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk in the dark valley, I fear no evil, for you are at my side. With your rod and your staff that give me courage. Okay, and so on. Again, Funny it's answer. David writing. Okay, and you can see he grows up out in those pastures, leading his sheep. Okay, and now God has called him to be king, and he's reflecting upon those days that he spent out there alone while his other brothers were doing whatever. He was out there with the sheep in the peace and quiet, tending the sheep out in the field. Okay, walking through the dark valleys as the sun was setting. Okay? It's important when reading that text, we read it in its context, and suddenly it'll come alive to us. Okay? Um, keep your hand in the Psalms and turn back to 2 Samuel chapter 7. 2 Samuel chapter 7. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 8. Verse 8. 
It's a very important text, and you should, really should memorize it as far as a reference. It's the covenant that God makes with David, the Davidic covenant. Now, therefore, thus shall um, you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be prince over my people Israel, and I have been with you wherever you want, went, and have cut off all your enemies from before you, and I will make... For you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, that they may dwell in their own place. Uh, and so on. Verse 12. When your days are fulfilled, and you lie down with your father, I will raise up your offspring after you, and you shall come forth, and, I'm sorry, who shall come forth from your body, and I will establish his kingdom, and he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. Mm -hmm. And so on. Okay, the great covenant that God makes with David. Flip back to the Psalms. Keep in your finger there in 2 Samuel. <clears throat> Psalm 89. Psalm 89. Psalm 89, verse 1. The favors of the Lord I will sing forever. Through all generations my mouth shall proclaim your faithfulness. For you have said, My kindness is established forever. In heaven you have confirmed your faithfulness. I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David, my servant. Forever will I confirm your posterity and establish your throne for all generations. Remember we just read that text, right. right? Reading it then out of context doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Okay? So again, when you're reading the Psalms, which hopefully you will do more and more, okay? When you're reading the Psalms, go back and read the story of King David and get that memorized in your head. Who was this man? Then you can go read those Psalms and suddenly what was very difficult hopefully will come alive. Okay? Um, we looked at the, at the Davidic covenant in chapter 7, 2 Samuel chapter 7. Turn back to 2 Samuel chapter 11. I'm sorry. 2 Samuel chapter 11. Chapter 11, verse 1. Go ahead, Andrew. In the spring of the year, the time when kings were forth in the battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him, and all Israel. And they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Groa. But David remained at Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking upon the roof of the king's house, that he saw from the roof from the roof a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman. And one said, Is not that this Bathsheba, the daughter of Iliam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So David sent the messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she was purifying herself from her own cleanness. Okay, and so on. Bad idea. Okay, so David, the great king, ends up falling again. Again, the story of salvation history. This back and forth. This battle between good and evil. Okay? You guys know the story. What happens? Someone remind me. What does he do? Yeah, he, killed, he, sa he sends for Bathsheba's husband, right? And what does he say? He says, go and take uh, Uriah, her husband, and put him at the very front line of the battle going on with Israel. Okay? And he puts him as a front soldier and the guy is killed. Okay? Again, a bad idea. Um... Chapter 11, verse 26. Go ahead, Sheila. When the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she made lamentation for her husband. And when the morning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Okay, and so on. The rest of the book of 1 Kings then is the story of King David ruling. He becomes extremely wealthy. Okay, he extends the frontier of Israel. Okay, all the way down. We talked about last time to the Euphrates River. And he actually ends up establishing the kingdom of Israel like God had desired them to do back in the day of Joshua. Okay, 
So again, we're following that line all the way through. Now the kings have come back to the surface, if you will, and that line there in the book of Ruth, the genealogy in the book of Ruth, from Perez, okay, all the way then to Jesse. You guys remind me, why was it that we kind of lost that line for a while? Why the, the line of kings wasn't mentioned after Judah? It just kind of, nothing happens for a while. Why? What's that? Well, no, but yes, and then he ends up having, or his, his daughter is a uh, daughter-in-law, and then he ends up having Perez, right? And what happens right after that with, with the 12 sons of Israel? They went to Egypt. Yeah, they go into Egypt, right? And if you're the one to receive the blessing, which Judah receives, to be the head of the family, what aren't you going to do when you're in slavery to another king? You're not going to stand up on the table and say, I'm the ruler, I'm the ruler, right? So you get this suppression of the text. We don't find out about the kings of Israel again until they're back in the land and they're established, everything's safe, and finally the Davidic, or the, the line of Judah shows up again. Okay? <coughs> Fine. Um, First Kings, chapter 1. If you scan through 2 Samuel, it is a story of Judah. Or, I'm sorry, it's a story of uh, King David. 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 1. Go ahead, Andrew. Now King David was old and advanced in years, and although they covered him with clothes, he could not get born. Okay, and so on. So he's, good. he's growing old. Chapter 1, verse 32. King David said... Call to me Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, Benaiah the son of Jehoiada. So they came before the king, and the king said to them, Take with you the servants of your of your lord, and cause Solomon my son to ride on my own mule, and bring him down to be home. And let Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet there anoint him king over Israel. Then blow the trumpet and say, Long live King Solomon. Okay, so they go ahead and do this. What's that sound like, by the way? No. What's that? Nepotism. <laughs> no. It's not nepotism. It's not. No, no, no. What other story in, in the Bible does that remind you of? Oh, Jacob and Esau. No. All the sons of Who? Yeah, what was that? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right? Remember, Jesus is he's coming into Jerusalem, okay, where he's going to be enthroned upon the cross. He doesn't just come in walking like whatever. He goes, he says, go get me a mule. And he jumps on top of the mule, and he rides it in. Okay? All the while, the people are thinking, is this the Messiah? Is this the king? Is this the anointed one of Israel? So what does he do? He doesn't say, take it easy, take it easy. He goes and gets on a mule, because he knows what that means. If you remember, the promise to the son of David would be that his throne would reign forever. You can imagine, often, unfortunately, and Paul's saying he's not too far away from us, we're giving these little palms in church, and one little thing, and we stand there and feel kind of stupid with it. Okay? They didn't have little scissors to cut little pieces of palm off the trees. They would have been yanking branches off of the trees. Uh, there's a reason, because when the king was enthroned, they would take huge branches and wave them in the air. And they would say, Hosanna to the son of David. Hosanna to the son of David. And they're out there and they're ripping these branches down. And the entire Jerusalem is filled for the Feast of Passover. I mean, jam-packed. And they're ripping branches off the trees. And Jesus goes ahead and jumps on the mule and rides in. Could you imagine the intensity of the situation. Okay, so he's using this Old Testament background. That's why you got to know this stuff. Okay? Um, where are we? First Kings chapter 2, verse 10. First Kings chapter 2, verse 10. Go ahead, Andrew. But David slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. And the time that David reigned over Israel was 40 years. He reigned seven years in Hebron and 33 years in Jerusalem. So Solomon sat upon the throne of David, his father, and his kingdom was firmly established. Okay, chapter 4, verse 32. He also uttered 3,000 proverbs. Well, hold on, let's just uh, go back to 29. Verse, chapter 4, verse 29. And God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding beyond measure, and largeness of mind like the sand on the seashore, so that Solomon's wisdom surpassed the wisdom of all the people of the east and all the wisdom of Egypt. For he was wiser than all other men, wiser than Ethan the Ezra, Ezraite, and Heman, Calcol, and Darda, and the sons of Jamal. 
and his fame was in all the nations round about. He also uttered 3,000 proverbs, and his songs were a thousand and a Okay, what was that now? He uttered what? Where are you at right now? Verse 32. Chapter 4, verse 32. Okay, we stopped at 19. What's that? New American stops at 19. Oh, we're in the American. We're in the official Roman Catholic. Bible you like and you choose. <laughs> Not the word. Give me your time. I know. Hold on. Slow down. Yes. Good. Chapter 5, verse 9. Now, hold on. It's a great learning experience for us. The stupid chapter and verse breaks in your Bible that's not divinely inspired. Okay? There's parts where they're so stupid. It's ridiculous. They put it in there, that spot, and so it throws you off, and everybody's confused. And when you get when you're reading a story and the story continues and there's a chapter break, take and scratch out the chapter, okay? Because it's just confusing. That happens in the Gospel of John all over the place, and it's terrible, okay? Also, Genesis one through three that happens. And you shouldn't stop there. You gotta keep reading. So, anyways, okay, we're at again chapter five, verse nine, and chapter. 432. Am I right? He uttered a bunch of proverbs. Am I right? Yeah. Okay, don't worry. Here's my only point. Right in that text somewhere in your Bible, it says, Solomon uttered many proverbs, thousands of proverbs. What book is Solomon his, uh, known for writing? Proverbs. The book of Proverbs. Just like his father wrote songs, he traditionally was held to write Proverbs. So again, what are you going to do before you read Proverbs? Read about King Solomon, because otherwise we're just opening our Bible. Oh, let's see what God's going to say to me today. <laughs> Bad idea. We're given an intellect for a reason. Okay? All right. Fine. That was way more confusing than it needed to be. First Kings, chapter 6, verse 1. We're all going to be on the same page on this one. Chapter 6, verse 1. Trying to read both on my new All right. Chapter 6, verse 1. You want to read that for us in your nice Catholic Bible? <laughs> in the 480th year from the departure of the Israelites from the land of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month of Ziv, which is the second month, the construction of the temple of the Lord was begun. Okay. Yes. So mine says 479. Wait. All right. Come on. Let's keep it. All right. He began to build the house of the Lord. Okay? It is God's desire through salvation history that he dwell with man. Where was the first house of God? In the desert. Eden. Yeah, the Garden of Eden. Okay? So look, God likes the same kind of pictures on his walls. Okay? Just like you and I. You're going to build a new house, you're going to hang the same pictures on the walls, right? Right. Paradise, the house of God, always looks the same. When you're reading the text about the temple, what usually throws you off when you stop reading about it? The measurements. Yeah, 45,000 cubits this way. Not 1,000, but you know what I mean? And this and that and everything and all the detail. And people stop reading. Unfortunately, that's the most important part. I'm not trying to get into it today. But when you're reading through the story of the temple, you think it's God's dwelling place. What does God's dwelling place look like? Where are you going to go back and read? Genesis chapter 1 through 3, the first house of God on earth. And then you're going to go and read about this new house of God being built. And guess what it's going to look like? The same. Carved into the inner sanctuary of the temple, into the walls. Palm trees, lilies, gourds, figs, hanging off the posts in the temple. 200 golden pomegranates hanging
hanging off a wooden post. What does that look like to you? Tree. Yeah, a fruit tree. Okay? And when man goes and enters back into that temple, what do you think God's going to tell him to do? The same thing he told him in the beginning. When the high priest is told to go into the Holy of Holies, he said, what is he to do? He said to do two things. To avad and shamar in Hebrew. To till it and to keep it. Okay? Because God is reestablishing paradise. The place where he will communicate himself to man. Okay? That's not even my notes, so I've got to keep to my notes because we're going to run out of time. Um, we're, 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 chapter, chapter 6, verse 11. Do we read that? No. Okay, well, there it is. We're not going to read it. There's your story about your gourds and lilies. Okay? And fig trees and whatnot. So you can read that if you want. Chapter 6, what? Chapter 6, verse 11, and so forth. Open flowers, gourds. Oh, it's beautiful. All covered in gold. In the middle of the Holy of Holies was the Ark of the Covenant. Yeah. What about the two trees, the tree of life and death? Uh, that's a good question. You're going to have to wait on that for Lent, because when we go back and we redo this thing on a, on a typological level, okay, we're going to look at that point, especially. Okay, but uh, I was going to say one thing about it. Oh, I'll tell you one thing about it. What guarded the way to the tree of life? Sword. The angel. The angel with a flaming sword guarding the way to the tree of life. So what do you think God puts at the gate to the Holy of Holies? Two huge 45-foot golden angels with their wings outstretched. Okay, if anybody ever tells you God didn't ever command somebody to make a graven image, 45-foot golden angels, okay, an image of the things in heaven above. Okay, we misread the Ten Commandments when we're reading it, and uh, unfortunately read it out of context, and so we don't say that, look, God just broke his own commandment if we're going to read it that way. God doesn't break his commandments. Talk about that another time. Chapter 6, verse 38. Chapter 6, verse 38. And in the eleventh year, in the month of Bull, which is the eighth month, the house was that the house was finished in all its parts. This is the house of the Lord, the temple. According to all its specifications, he was seven years in building it. Why do you think? Seven days. Yeah, it's a parallel to the seven days of creation. In fact, it's on the seventh month that they dedicate it. Okay? And it goes even further than that. We'll get into that again during Lent. Um, chapter 8, verse 1. Uh, chapter 8, verse 1 talks about the Ark of the Covenant being brought to Jerusalem. Okay? With great dancing, they bring it in and everything. It's, it's wonderful. Okay? Brought into the temple. Are the seven years supposed to correspond to creation? Yes, that's what we're saying. That's that number seven in Hebrew speaks of the covenant, okay, between God and man. Yes. Sorry, to go back to Exodus when they have all oh, those no. instructions <laughs> of building the so by so cubic yes. layer within the layer. Where'd that one go? That's a tent. Okay, they build a portable house of God in the desert, and they bring it to a tent, and they go in and set it up in the Holy Land, and that's where the ark dwells until they build the temple. So it's just been sitting there on this. Probably. Okay, it says it's dwelling in the house of these different guys and stuff. It doesn't really say where it goes. So I would guess that it's kept near the ark, all that stuff, but we don't really know. Okay? Um, chapter 11, verse 1. Okay, we've got to get through this stuff. So. Yes. Now, King Solomon loved many foreign women. The daughter of Pharaoh, and Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidian, and Hittite women. From the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the people of Israel, You shall not enter into marriage with them, neither shall they with you. For surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. And Solomon clung to these in love. He had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines. And his wives turned away his heart. For when Solomon was old, and his wives turned away his heart after other gods. Okay, and he goes and ends up building shrines and idols. These other gods to Molech. You know what they did to Molech? Sacrifice children. Okay, so things are not all good with Solomon either. Again, that battle between good and evil. Um, okay, we got to talk about one last thing, and it'll probably take five minutes. Can you guys give me five minutes? And then we'll conclude. Okay. 
First Kings chapter eleven, verse twenty-six. First Kings chapter eleven, verse twenty-six. We're right there. Okay, so David or Solomon falls into sit, into these into these traps. He builds these idols and whatever. And what's going to happen to him? He turns away from God. He turns away from his life, his protection, and suddenly things are going to unravel on him. Okay, Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. An Ephraimite of Zeradah, a servant of Solomon, whose mother's name was Zeruah, a widow, also lifted up his hand against the king. And this was the reason why he lifted up his hand against the king. Solomon built the Milo and closed up the breach of the city of David, his father. The man Jeroboam was very able, and when Solomon saw that the young man was industrious, he gave him charge over all the forced labor of the house of Joseph. And at that time, when Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem, the prophet Ahijah, the, Sh- the Shilonite, found him on the road. Now Ahijah had clad himself with a new garment, and the two of them were alone in the open country. Then Ahijah laid hold of the new garment that was on him and tore it into twelve pieces and said to Jeroboam, Take for yourself ten pieces, for thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Behold, I am about to tear the kingdom from the hand of Solomon. And will give you ten tribes, but he shall have one tribe for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem, the city which I have chosen, because he has forsaken me and worshipped Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonites, Chemosh, the god of Moab, and Milcom, the god of the Ammonites, and has not walked in my ways, doing what is right in my sight and keeping my statutes and my ordinances as David his father did. Okay, verse 40. Verse 40. Solomon sought therefore to to kill Jeroboam, but Jeroboam arose and fled into Egypt. So he goes to Egypt, this guy who's to be given these ten these ten tribes. Okay? Okay, I've got two minutes. Chapter 12, verse 1. It's a very important text. This point right here is going to determine your reading of the New Testament properly. Okay? Now, who did we just talk about? What was that guy's name? Okay, I'm just going to put J-E-R up here because I can't spell Jeroboam. Jeroboam. Now, we've got a guy that sounds very close. You've got to keep him straight. Chapter 12, verse 1. Rehoboam went to Shechem. Now, Rehoboam is Solomon's son. Okay? Solomon ends up dying. Rehoboam takes his place. Okay? Chapter 12, verse 6. Then King Rehoboam took counsel that he just got made king. Okay? Solomon dies. He's made king. Then Rehoboam took counsel with the old men who had stood before Solomon, his father, while he was yet alive, saying, How do you advise me to answer this people? And they say to him, If you will be a servant to this people today, and serve them, and speak good words to them, then you, uh, when you answer them, then they will be your servants forever. But he forsook the counsel. Okay, stop for a second, because we skipped a couple verses that are important. They come to him and they say, Your father Solomon taxed us to death. He brought all of our men and put them into forced work. He put them into the army and all this stuff. We need some relief. And so then he goes and gets the counsel of the old men, the wise men of the, of the country, okay, as Rehoboam does. Verse 8, But he forsook the counsel which the old men gave him, and took counsel with the young men who had grown up with him and stood before him. And he said to them, What do you advise that we answer this people who have said to me, Listen, uh, lighten the yoke that your father put on us. And the young men who had grown up with him said to them, Thus shall you speak to the people who said to you, Your father made our yoke heavy, but, but do you lighten it for us? Thus shall you say to them, My little finger is thicker than my father's loins. And now, whereas my father laid upon you a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. Oh. What is that? Bad guy. Bad guy. So what happens? He probably gets killed. Um, I want to just read this whole thing. 
Okay, let's keep reading just for a second. So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam on the third day, as the king said, Come to me again the third day. And the king answered the people harshly, forsaking the counsel which the old men had given him. And he spoke to them according to the counsel of the young men, saying, My father made your yoke heavy, but I will add to your yoke. My father chastised you with whips, I with scorpions. So the king did not hearken to the people, for it was a turn of affairs brought about by the Lord, that he might fulfill his word, which the Lord spoke to uh, by the... Uh, Ahijah, the Shilonite, to Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. And when all of Israel saw that the king did not hearken to them, the people answered, What portion have we with, with David? We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel, look now to your own house, David. Okay? This is an extremely important point in salvation history. At this point, the twelve tribes of Israel break in half. Okay. If you got your map back there, if you didn't, don't worry. Just stay with me for a second. Grab it on the way back. I got it. I've got it there for you on this side. If you if you grabbed it, okay. You'll notice down below if you read closely, it says Judah, the southern kingdom. And this gets very confusing. The southern kingdom, which stays with the Davidic king, they stay with Rehoboam, <coughs> and they stay with Jerusalem. They do not break. They end up being called Judah, the southern kingdom. Okay, But the northern ten tribes... Okay. By this time, Benjamin has gotten taken up into Judah because there was a whole war that happened. Okay, The northern ten tribes go with um, Jeroboam and they create the kingdom of Israel. Okay. It gets confusing because, wait, is Israel the good one or not? Okay, I thought Israel was the good one. Not anymore. Okay. They have just broken from the Davidic king. Okay, even though the guy was bad, you still don't break. You get an evil pope, we've had plenty of bad popes, guys. You don't break with him because he's a bad guy. Okay, and so um, Rehoboam will rule in the south, and Jeroboam will rule in Israel. And the center of the kingdom of Israel in the north, the, the throne city that he sets up, will be called what? Samaria. He sets up his throne city in Samaria, in the city of Samaria. Eventually, the entire northern kingdom will be called Samaria. Samaria and the people that dwell there will be called the Samaritans. Okay? You understand why that's important for me in the New Testament? We're going to find out who the Samaritans really are because they end up doing all sorts of crazy things. Okay? Um... <coughs> And, in, and the city in the south stays in Jerusalem. Okay? So it gets confusing because Rehoboam stays with Jerusalem, but Jeroboam, it kind of sounds like uh, Jerusalem, breaks. Okay? Yes? But it says in, the chapter, in verse 30 that um, the Bible shrines were set up in Bethel and Dan. They were. Is there a def difference? Yeah. Look at, let's read this last verse and then we'll call it good. Chapter 13, is that where you're at or no? Chapter 12. Chapter 12, verse 28. This is important. So the king, now this is Jeroboam. This is the guy that went down to Egypt, remember? He fled into Egypt because Solomon was going to kill him. So the king took counsel and made two calves of gold. Why did he make two calves of gold? Where did he just vacation for a while? Egypt. In Egypt, you remember, the Egyptians worshipped the gold, the calf, right? And it was the cult of the firstborn. It was a fertility cult. So he goes down to Egypt. He brings back some of the things with them. He sets up two golden calves. And he said to the people, You have gone up to Jerusalem long enough. Behold, your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Oh my gosh, terrible. Okay? And so he sets up two golden calves in order that the people don't go and worship in Jerusalem anymore. Okay? So you get this division in the kingdom of God. The rest of the book of 1st and 2nd Kings will be the story of the kings of the north and the south. And it keeps going back and forth between the two. Okay? Until eventually they both get rocked. They both get 
uh, beat up by other people, okay? And taken off, and we'll deal with that next time, okay? So we leave it with the two golden calves in the north, and so on. We'll take a 30 second break. If anyone wants to stay for questions, I'm happy to answer them. So um, find it if you need to go. Exit, stage left, and uh, if you're going to stay, grab some wine, finish off what we have there, and I'll answer five minutes of questions, that's all I'm going to do, and then we'll call it, we'll call it done. Okay, hold on, we're going to take just quickly a couple questions. Uh, okay. Who's got a question? I do. Okay, hold on, Norma, can you raise your hand? Okay, okay go. Okay, okay. okay. Um, about the post. <laughs> Well, I'm just curious because it says that this tournament was from the Lord. Yeah. So how do you reconcile that thing with the Pope if he's bad? Because obviously God split the kingdoms. Uh, God allowed the kingdom to be split, but he never desired the evil man, okay? So God allowed, for example, the Society of St. Pius X, right, to break off in 19... 19- 70 or 88. Okay? But it wasn't his desire. And it doesn't mean we should go and follow them. Okay? So if you read that text a little closer, you follow that line, keep reading those things, you watch. Israel is condemned, the northern kingdom is condemned by God for doing what they did. But God allows it to happen. Okay. It's like the hardening of the heart of Pharaoh. Okay. Right? I have a follow up question, but it's really okay. 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 Oh, come on, just sit down. Where are you going to go? <laughs> come on, just sit down. Right. I'm here. I'm here. I have to go. Go check the book. All right, we'll look at that in a minute. I'll look at your Bible in a minute. Okay, any other questions? Yes? Well, I guess it's along the same lines. It was back in First Samuel 16, where it says Solomon was tormented by an evil spirit sent by the Lord. Ah. Yes, okay. Again, right, and oftentimes in the scriptures it appears as though God does something, okay? And I think the better way to read that is to say that God allows something to take place. We, we, uh, oh God, why do you allow so and so to get in that car accident? Well, it's not that God desired the person to die, right? But he allows something to take place based upon our own actions, okay? We're not uh, robots, okay? And so, you know. I don't know if that's a decent answer or not. Okay. Yes. We can go back to Exodus for a minute. Yeah. Um, in two twenty-five. Go ahead. I know. The Lord it. looked upon the children of Israel, <laughs> and He knew them. And He knew them. Yes. Yes. So what is that? Is that like how did how does that fit in with the, what we talked about knowing in the Bible? Okay. Somebody else answer that question for me. I'm using. All right. <laughs> Yeah, and so uh, I think your text actually in other in other um, rendition says remembered, probably in that text. But it's the same idea. Is again that idea of knowledge, and knowledge is the union of the knower and the known as one thing. So when it says God remembered Israel, it doesn't mean that God forgot Israel. It's that He's about to bring about this restoration of the covenant. Okay, so God knows his people, or whatever. Again, the union is about to take place in a more intimate way again. And so they're about to be brought to Sinai, where Moses, and uh, initially they were all supposed to go and see God, but they wouldn't go up at first. And so Moses goes up by himself, and bam he lights up like a light bulb, right? So, like God does. Like God lights up like light bulb. <laughs> okay, what else? That's it? Well, in the... Uh Let's show a problem question. with the... Uh, yes. Okay, in uh, chapter 11. Mm-hmm. Okay, where God takes the... Uh, and gives the ten tribes to Joab. Mm-hmm. Okay. And in the bottom, if you, if you read down here, okay, yeah. Yeah. 35, but I will take the kingdom from his son and give it to you. Okay, so yes. why is that the bad... The ten tribes, why are they the bad... Because they never should have broken loyalty with his throne, even though the king was doing what he shouldn't have been doing. And he's going to go and overtax them and overburden them, but that doesn't give it. It's just like, you know, um, I don't know what the, I was going to say, like a son with his father. Like, it's still his father, and you're still united as best you can. Now, if he starts telling you you're doing moral things, you don't do them. Okay? But that's not what's going on. They got a bad king, he's an oppressor, and they say, well, forget you, we're going to go off on our own. And you see the result of it. They end up 
Well, you will see the result of it. They end well, up. Well, if Judah followed the Lord on right. this, mm-hmm. he would have been the good tri- the, the good tribes. Okay, read it to me again. Okay. Oh, he says, yeah. He says, yeah, if you will follow me, I, I will. I will take. Take you, you shall reign over all that you desire and shall become yeah. king of Israel. Yeah. If then you heed all that I command you, yeah. follow my ways and please me by keeping my statutes and my commandments. Then like I my servant David. David. Then what? But he, apparently he, well, he did. Right, exactly. So again, <laughs> I would say to uh, Saul. Right. I would say it's a story again like uh, Rahab, okay, where. A person can, even though, let's say, they're, they're not in the covenant line, okay, then they still can be blessed by God by following his, his statutes, okay? And I would guess, I don't know God's will, but I would guess that what he would have done was then brought the t- tribes back together again, okay, at the right time, in the right way, at the right place, okay? I mean, is it possible for God to bless, um, you know... Protestants, or to bless Jews, or to bless... Yeah, of course he does. All the time, when they follow him and do the right thing. And, and as Catholics, uh, our hope and our belief is that he will lead them through his blessings, his bestowal of grace, to their ultimate destiny, and that is full union uh, in the body of Christ. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay, all right, that's good. Finish up that with back there, and I'll answer whatever if you guys have any other questions, okay? See you next week. Bring